appreciate it. Hello, everyone. Uh, great to great to be here and talking about uh, an excellent book of the art of magic. I'm, I'm always very eager to point out that both the name of the book and the spelling of it uh, were not conscious choices on our part to sound oldie worldy or uh, but but it is highlighting that some of the uh, the, the, the two practitioners uh, whose books and scrying records we have uh, were not, shall we say, uh, burdened with an overabundance of humility. Um, that is to say that the, the text we're talking about today and the, and the text that uh, the, the Scarlets um, were, 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 were good enough to, to publish in these lovely books uh, concerns two treatises, I suppose we could say, two texts bound together uh, along with a bunch of other texts in British Library Additional Manuscript 36674. Uh, we can see the, the front page of the thing that will be called the excellent book uh, here. It's the result of uh, a set of experiments that are occurring in 1567, in the spring of 67, uh, among, uh, between uh, two practitioners that we'll get to in a second. The reason it's a significant text, I, I feel, or well, the two texts are significant, is that we have both the book and the, the, the grimoire, if we like, a manual, a handbook of, of how to summon spirits, including noti of little, like uh, almost asides, like, oh, when you're doing this, don't do that. Uh, but we also have uh, a text, an appended text, uh, an attendant scrying record of their visions, uh, called visions. And this gives us kind of a behind the scenes of not just what to do, but kind of why they thought that that was what you had to do. If only because, well, a spirit turned up and told us that if we wanted to do magic, we should do this thing, uh, which is a consistent feature of it. And so who were these, who were these, who were these gentlemen? HG and JD are, we're, we're pretty certain, are, are, are Humphrey Gilbert and John Davies. Like it's the, the, the pieces keep matching up to suggest that it's, it's definitely them. These are quote explorers uh, of a particular um, British uh, colonial persuasion, shall we say. And I don't want to overly dwell on their biographies. We, you know, we, we kind of, um, uh, these, these, are, these are famous men in their own right. Uh, John Davis is a navigator who gives his name to the Davis Strait and the Northwest Passage, and also uh, comes up with some actual navigation tools that were used. Um, and these are contemporaries of John D, who after all, Dr. D was not only, you know, uh, prefacing Euclid's mathematics and uh, calling up Enochian spirits to uh, spy on uh, Poland, uh, but he was also, you know, engaged in the navigation that formed the, you know, nation and coined British Empire. Gilbert, uh, we know a lot, a lot more about. Um, and again, I, I don't want to dwell on these um, uh, customers uh, too much because I want to talk instead about the entities, beings, experiences they had in the course of doing their scrying, as we'll see, this is an important part of their work and their conjuring. So that's the, that's the half of the things that I want to talk about uh, before uh, I, I pass over to my good friend Phil uh, to talk a little more about the ritual poesis and uh, the, 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 the speech magics that are evidenced uh, in, these, in, these, in this work and it's behind the scenes how we got the work, right? Which is effectively scrying in not a dissimilar manner to the operations of Dr. D and his various scryers, including uh, Mr. Kelly. So with this fabulous illustration from, from Sin Eater uh, that, that I love, uh, I'm here to give a brief survey of the spiritual creatures encountered in the scry scrying and conjuring of HG and JD, evidenced in British Library NS Additional Manuscript 36674. Okay, so the first spirit arguably that they encounter, or at least that HG encounters, is King Solomon. Uh, and so we have a notion of outside of whatever else we might use to, uh, to describe as, as Solomonic magic. We have an actually Solomonic magic in many ways. A dream uh, is had uh, and is reported. And in this dream, King Solomon, on the 20th of February, no less, delivers this prayer. And this prayer is the Preparation, we could say, is the is the opening, is the initiator, we might even say, of, of this set of workings that occur over the, the next couple months. And there's some fascinating features here. We're asking, uh, you know, uh, God to, uh, you know, grant us the usual kinds of things, holiness, um, veracity, may this be accurate, may no, no lying spirits turn up, may who we think is talking to us be who, who is actually talking to us. 
we desire learning. Uh, and this is a consistent feature of not just summoning spirits to be like, oh, you, you, you're a spirit, but asking them uh, to bring knowledge uh, and understanding crucially in a variety of ways. So even as it was to thy servant Solomon and this concept of Solomon's kingship and service is an interesting tension that plays out through the texts, I would say. Having said that that's the first spirit, the, the term first spirit is applied not to, not to Solomon. After all, that's, that's the way that you get access to be able to channel this magical text to be able to then summon these spirits. The first spirit of the text is listed as the ruler of the dead, whose name is Asasel. Right? This is almost certainly Azazel, the, 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 the quote fallen angel of the Enochic as opposed to Enochian traditions. And one of the main things that we ascribe this potentially literal scapegoat is that the whole earth has been corrupted through the works that were taught by Azazel. To him, we ascribe all sin. Now, beyond that, you know, general uh, category of, of scapegoating, we find some particular things that uh, uh, Azazel in the, in the Enochic literature is uh, specifically said to have uh, helped mankind uh, create or achieve weapons and cosmetics uh, are among the two uh, of, of, of love and war, uh, you know, once more. So what is uh, a fallen angel doing in a 16th century uh, English text of, of conjuration and scrying? Well, well, it turns out quite a lot. As Daniel Harms has, has shown in, in, in his uh, article for, for Thanatos uh, on the, the Keeper of the Bones right, uh, Azazel or, or, or variations on that term seem to be popping up a lot in the, in the 16th century and give us these workings where we are appealing to Azazel as the keeper of dead men's bones. Right? And you are asking uh, this very senior spirit to, to sign off, to give you the authority to be able to call uh, the shades or the uh, departed souls of, uh, of, of the dead. And this is done, as we'll see here in one example at least, going to the place uh, where, where, the, where the dead are. Uh, there's uh, often emphasis on knocking, uh, usually three times. Sometimes that's with a hazel wand. Sometimes that's, uh, most commonly that's on the, uh, on the grave itself. Sometimes it's on the headstone if there is one. Uh, sometimes it's stamping three times. Uh, but this is this is generally the kind of thing that's done and where it's done sometimes depends and the fact that we have these variations of these various keeper of the bones rights uh you know should I, I think be suggesting to us the uh the veracity and the uh vitality for want of a better and less punny term of this kind of necromantic tradition folk tradition in, throughout uh, you know the early modern british isles at least so having done this the magician is said to depart the grave and return home and the dead individual may appear to the magician in a dream or appear later and, and, and specifically again, not just to, to summon a ghost for the sake of being spoopy, but for information. So we see a more particular way that we might be doing this and again, working with this, this spirit in these kinds of contexts. Uh, in short, that again, the Lord of dead men's bodies uh, and we're taking in this case, grave from the dead body at the head, uh, binding it in a clean cloth of linen and laying it under the right ear that you can listen to sleep. Uh, so again, we have a, 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 a dreaming bundle, if we like, um, a, a haunted pillow of another sort. And of course, there's some timing instructions and things like that. This is, I will just remind as an aside, and because I, 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 I will get on the soapbox forever, this is the seal of Zazel, the ruling spirit of Saturn, not Azazel. Friends don't let their friends use the seal of Zazel for Azazel. So why am I banging on about uh, a, a ruler of dead men? Because one of the, the features that most, honestly most appeals to me about the excellent book is that they are summoning dead magicians to learn how to do magic better. Um, and again, they're not burdened with an overabundance of humility. Uh, these gentlemen are summoning King Solomon, are summoning uh, Roger Bacon, are summoning Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa, who is not, you know, long cold, uh, at this in, in 67, uh, Adam, the Adam, um, Job, and St. Luke and the Evangelists uh, as well. And uh, okay, maybe maybe it's unfair to call St. Luke and the Evangelists dead magicians, um, but I mean it in a, in a, uh, in, in a welcoming and non-pejorative sense, so sure you. So these magicians turn up and give various advice about how to summon spirits, not just other dead magicians, but, but other spirits uh, entirely. And in brief, we get this lovely little, mm, this little, this little piece here where 
you know, they're, in, they're, they're they even ask like, what is, why, why are we, why are we dealing with all these dead folks? And Solomon said to H.G. and John, uh, that H.G. and John should rule him. And also Job said to John's hearing, trust no spirit visible or invisible, but the spirit of dead men, for they love man more than the others do. And this is a, an interesting feature where we have a tension between not just antagonistic spirits who, who, who might hate humans, but certainly might not like being bound into a circle and, uh, and threatened with, with swords and books and things. So again, we see a, an engagement with spirits and, and as we see ecologies and worlds of spirit that are not entirely uh, collaborative or um, you know, nonviolent even. So once we have summoned Azazel using the excellent book, uh, and there's an intermediary spirit of uh, Eosel, uh, we come to four very senior spirits, four very important spirits in, in the early modern period uh, who stand in cruciatus locus, right? At the, at the cardinal points of the crossroads. Uh, these are of course uh, the, the four regents of Oriens and Maimon. Paimon and Egin, who are spirits of the major hierarchy, as is said in the uh, uh, 12th, uh, 13th to 14th century, right? Major hierarchy, and have under them legions of spirits. So who are these entities? We, we may have heard their names bandied about. For a start, uh, uh, my you know, friend and colleague, Jake Stratton Kent has done some fantastic work in uh, getting us to grips with the importance of understanding cardinal spirits and their uh, that the crux of them, if we will, in the grimoire tradition, and that the, at the very least, certain the idea of ru ruling spirits, of important spirits at the four quarters, at the four cardinal directions, um, and often assigned a, a, an elemental uh, flavor, if not rulership, uh, uh, goes back a while and is and is a big deal. Specifically, specifically, then. These four spirits uh, we find at the in the Libra de Spritz, which then forms the basis of a variety of other uh, grimoires, including the, the list that will inform Via, that will inform eventually the Le Megaton and, and, and the, the Quote Goisha of Solomon. But in our Kistis Demex translation of the Book of Spirits, it said, at the beginning of this book, I placed the names of the spirits who are the governors and masters of all the other spirits of the region and office of Lucifer, of the office of Belzebub, of Satan, and of the four spirits who are the rulers of the four regions and quarters of the world, i.e. Orient, Poimon, Omoimon, and Equi in this case, which is, 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 is probably a, you know, a, an error of, of, of bad handwriting. Doctors throughout time have not been kind to us in their paleography. Uh, this idea of them being at the four corners of the world often links uh, the four regions to the primary winds uh, to matters of health. This is, uh, you know, uh, for Castle of Health, but we also have uh, a lot of Floodian ideas about that kind of stuff. Hayden, uh, John Hayden has a lot of stuff to say about uh, the Four Regents as Fallen Angels as well. This is a, a kind of consistent feature here. Uh, I could bang on about them a lot, and I, and I have in other places, but I will stick to the excellent book rather than getting distracted by our, our Four Regents. So I said this was a scrying operation, which we may or may not be familiar with as um, uh, gazing into glimmering objects, whether that's a crystal ball or a burnished, uh, you know, mirror or, or simply a burnished metal uh, surface or a glittering sword, for instance, as, as in the, the art of Artificius, or uh, water bowls. Uh, the, the onychiomancy of the, of the, the, old, the old oiled thumbnail uh, is, a, is a whole way of, of scrying as well. Imagine that. My point here is that they're using showstones, multiple showstones, in some interesting tech, there, there seems to be a specifically uh, Sunday best showstone just for angels. There's another one that you can summon everyone into, even these kind of grubby, unclean, and, and you know uh, maybe a little like more mischievous spirits, uh, and some full-on you know devilish things. But what's interesting again is with these notai, we get a real sense of like what it is to do this stuff. What does spirit sign look like? It looks like you seeing a thing shadowy in the stone. Uh, which is in the wall, by the way. So we, we have an idea about what the actual ritual setup of this thing is. And therefore appear to me and speak or write, for I will not believe that here is anything to my sight, except thou speak or write and appear to my sight and speak to my hearing, or else I will accurse thee. And this is a consistent feature of the, the work as well, that these gentlemen are summoning these spirits, demanding information, and then testing the information in a variety of ways. It's, it, it gets pretty antagonistic, but there's also a feature of an emergent uh, uh, scientific epistemology that say Frank Larson has, has noted about the excellent book and its practitioners having one foot in the in the old dirty medieval magic and one foot in the emergent scientific methodology. 
There are some other interesting features that we can get from some of the more unsavory torture tactics. Uh, one of which is that spirits are considered not as elementals, but having elemental affinities and qualities, right? If the spirit be of fire and you need to, uh, you know, um, uh, force them to do things, then you can punish them with stinking water, right? If they be of air, uh, then you must command them to go forth into stone and it's some vile stinking mud and to tarry in it, right? So we are utilizing contrary elements in order to uh, force spirits. What's, what's interesting to me here is not like, how can we force spirits? How can we be, you know, horrible bastards? But how spirits are, are interacting with uh, elemental modalities. Uh, and you know, if we can, um, if we can, if we can uh, downregulate or, or suppress or oppress using contrary elements, uh, the idea of, of bolstering using uh, supporting elements and sympathetic elements is very interesting to me. I said we couldn't. I said it's maybe unfair uh, or, or maybe inaccurate to call uh, Saint Luke a dead magician, but he certainly starts turning up and uh, and and doing some particular things. There's there's a fascinating feature where he turns up and asks. Gilbert to stop cursing all these spirits out, uh, to leave using the names of God to hurt wicked and rebellious spirits and offering to do it himself. So St. Luke becomes an intermediary so that we don't have to get our hands dirty in many ways, or so we don't have to spend you know, hours getting very choleric, shouting at stones and smoke and the spirits that uh, cohere around them and, and instantiate through them. What are these spirits looking like? Well, they're not just turning up in the in the ritual space. They're also in the there 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 are engagements with a landscape and an ecology of spirit. And I mean this in in, in at least by the book standards, a pretty literal sense. There's this the, the idea of journeying into places that they that they they have visions of seeing themselves in a landscape, doing things, interacting with spirits. And so they are wandering through these landscapes and reporting on uh, the appearance of spirits, which is often marked bearing in mind that we have at the crux, I would say, of this grimoire, the idea that these ruling spirits are at the cardinal directions and aren't just there because they're, you know, big and important, but because they rule and can, and can mediate and um, affect and regulate uh, the spirits that come from those directions. There came two little birds from the north to the south flying uh, before lighted on the south side of us, which was on the left hand. This, this awareness of directionality always. And these two birds did fly again from the south toward the north and there came another bird from the south side of us and it flew toward the north and came back again towards us and flew toward the north again and then circled on the south side of us, right? There, there, there's, there's, some, there's some strange spirit augury going on in this, in this text and its visions. Along with some downright weird entities, right? Birds from the east to, uh, from the west towards the east with great wings and long tails, having no heads, four other blackbirds coming out of the west towards the east, having long necks and long tails with greater feet, all as big as their bodies. Dogs with little legs and great broad feet like unto horses, a great burning dog potentially. Uh, Brendan might mean uh, something else uh, as well. Trawling on the ground, two great black wings joined together without any body, hard by the ground. Some of these are like some, 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 some vaguely disturbing imagery. But what we have here that's interesting to me, again, 16th century demonology is starting to move away from what we might think of as more like impish kind of, you know, a, a devilish spirit turned up in the shape of a black dog or a, you know, or a, or a swan as, as sometimes they, they, they were, certain spirits were said to, and starts to take on these more, not chimeric, not quite he cometh in the form of, you know, familiar goetic offices of he cometh in the, the form of a, a lion with the head of another lion and that kind of thing. You know, but we start to see that these are not normal animals, shall we say. And this, this chimerism or this this um, this 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 un uncanniness, the you know the big feet or like backwards feet or without a head or, or some kind of feature that like just starkly shows you that they aren't quite what they what we might expect is is reflective of this this shiftiness in the spirits, and that's really where I want to kind of like conclude this part and kind of pass over to to to, to Phil is just to note that we have this example of the spirits making clear what's going on at least partly with some of this. Um, visitudinous nature that they seem to have where they are, um, you know, cohering and dissipating. Two marvelous great ravens, two of them, standing on the ground. One of them came flying upon him and so flew towards the southwest, the other flew away. But with much calling, they went into the east and divided themselves in three crows, 
and came and fell down by them, and being so commanded, did stay and speak these words. But they did first appear like ravens, and afterwards divided themselves into three crows, because they might not know them. Right? This concept of spirits not wanting, not just sitting there waiting for you to turn up and ask and, and tell them to do stuff. Right? This idea of spirits appearing not just in different forms, come thou in a comely form, right? But also appearing in, in different numbers. And in and this this uh, I think has some really interesting uh, consequences for thinking about legions, thinking about uh, what Jake calls uh, ghosts in the grimoires, um, uh, where uh, copyist entries seem to have of 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 made new spirits um, out of old ones, duplicating spirits across the paper trail of the uh, of the grimoire corpus, and from spirits on pages to what's read out of pages. I want to do the high five handoff uh, to, to Phil, and uh, I'm really excited to uh, uh, to hear about more um, uh, ritual poesis. So I'm gonna shut the heck up and, uh, and, sh and stop sharing. <laughs> okay, um, thank you, Al. Um, so um, both Al and I uh, really uh, interested in poetry as well as magic and particularly the relationship between uh, words and ritual magic. So that's what I'm going to concentrate on in this uh, talk. Um, but I'd like to begin by sharing a couple of thoughts about the concept of proof in the practice of magic. Um, I recently read a 2009 paper by Gerhard Meyer, where he talks about there the being three core motivations uh, for modern occultists that he interviewed uh, in getting involved in the practice of magic. So these were self-development, seeking transcendental knowledge, or simply trying to find out where the magic works. Um, <clears throat> and I'm sure that whether we're a practitioner or a coolly distance academic or kind of someone floating in between, we can probably deeply relate to the last of those. Um, you know, there must be something going on, sort of says the academic, perhaps looking at magic's place as a social phenomena. <clears throat> and so too says the curious neophyte, preparing to dip their toe into their first spell. So I'd suggest that this need to sort of prove that there's something going on in magic is not the product of a kind of mythical enlightenment scepticism that somehow characterizes the modern outlook and disenchanted the world a couple of hundred years ago. Um, but rather I'd say that it goes at least back to the late medieval roots of ritual magic when there was these curious mixtures of platonic mysticism, meeting Aristotelian scientific method, flooding into Europe via Arabic translations of treaties on alchemy, astrology, magic, and as well as secondhand kind of translations of the classical philosophers. So from that kind of point on, when we get this kind of influx of um, Arabic literature, um, influenced by both Plato and Aristotle and, and, and so on, um, <clears throat> we find magical rituals become more often than not described as experiments. Um, so we have the influential book De Negromancia, which was basically kind of the source book of late medieval magic, uh, attributed to Roger Bacon, who was of course later to become one of uh, Humphrey Gilbert's ghostly entourage. Um, and you find kind of pretty much all the rituals and spells in there are called an experiment of such and such. So I, it seems like this kind of experimental gloss can almost be seen as a kind of discursive move to reposition magic away from its troublingly kind of heret heretical or heterodox proximity to religion and into the arts and sciences. However, these are kind of experiments are not what we would know as a kind of scientific method or a deductive process. The actual proof that they work is through the experience it yields, as uh, Sophie Page discusses in her thesis. Um, so in the kind of historical sources, we find these experiments and they often have the words probatum est, it is proved, or have those words kind of added into the margin by a scribe or a subsequent reader. So I suspect that Gilbert's um, own kind of motivation was probably in this kind of experimental vein, his intention being to kind of prove where the magic worked and where the spirits 
were effective conveyors of material items and worldly knowledge. And evidently the magic did work to some extent. Gilbert and Davis at least proved it to themselves. Um, although from our kind of temporal perspective, it leaves us with more questions than answers. You know, what, what kind of really happened? Um, exactly how did their procedures work? And can we use this, their work to kind of prove that magic has some effect, even though it may not necessarily be what the tradition of the practitioners kind of believed it was happening. Um, so exactly turning to the kind of excellent book itself, exactly kind of how the excellent book, the kind of grimoire portion relates to the visionary portion is extremely kind of confused and confusing and convoluted. It's not 100% clear uh, in the text. Um, it seems that the excellent book was first begun on the 22nd of March, 1567, by which time this pair had been receiving visions for a month. The, um, but from the kind of spirits that we see mentioned in the excellent book and visions, it's apparent that they were drawing on a pool of earlier material, manuscripts already in circulation. And I've shown, show, showing a few kind of examples here, um, showing things like the spirits Azazel, Azazel, who Al has talked about, Bleeth, and the four uh, kings of the kind of um, winds or, or directions. But Azazel appears really early in the visions. Uh, the, you know, the, in the ones that precede the com composition of the excellent book. So it suggests that they've probably been kind of experimenting with conjuring spirits um, and kind of following some of these rituals as part of their own kind of scrying process. And then the excellent book comes along a bit later as their kind of codification into a coherent text of the, some of the practices they'd kind of done and some of the practices they kind of envisioned doing because uh, you know, shortly after Gilbert starts moving into conjuring the four kings, um, you know, once the composition of the excellent book is underway. It may have been kind of assembled under spiritual guidance. We're not sure he, prior, immediately prior to its composition, they encountered spirits called Ankor, Amilor, as well as Job, who promised to kind of share good books with them. Um, but one interesting um, aspect of this kind of codification is that they're not just assembling a kind of commonplace book of, of uh, chart rituals. Um, <clears throat> they're refashioning everything. They're removing all the kind of suspiciously kind of Catholic trappings and references to mass and the Virgin and uh, ritual tools and things uh, from the texts because they are, you know, of course, Protestants. So it ends up that all that is required for their practice is uh, glass, a, a scrying surface, inks, perfumes, clean apparel, and these good books to call by. But even while kind of working in this bare bones framework, these rituals, you know, even though they don't have massive circles and tons of sigils and things, they're still kind of incredibly dramatic practices. Um, of course, there's a vast body of literature in this genre of kind of grimoires and ritual magic, um, but the records of their efficacy are, and are often quite kind of at variance where they exist at all. But Gilbert's documents do indicate that the procedures did work profoundly um, after some manner. They, they profess themselves to encountering, seeing and conversing with spirits. Um, but going back to this kind of idea of proof, how we, can we propose any proof ourselves of this? And how can we even kind of begin to explore the complex dynamics of such rituals and experiences, or kind of even try to hope to get an inkling into reconstructing what may have happened, especially if we kind of were interested in pursuing this ourselves. Um, <clears throat> so one approach I've sort of explored with regard to this to try and make sense of some of the, the ritual work um, was through what Michael Storsberg and Bern Christian Otto called patterns of magicity. 
So as I'm sure you're aware, actually coming up with a definition of magic is extremely tricky. It's caused many a heated debate. Uh, many people have fall that, fallen out <laughs> over this um, because it's an amorphous cultural concept. And it usually defines itself by who is using it and to what end. So what Storsberg and Otto did was they conducted a meta-analysis of definitions of magic. They took all these definitions and kind of broke them down into uh, ir kind of irreducible sort of statements. So a single definition of magic will never kind of cover all of these. But for a particular instance of magic, you're likely to find overlapping factors, certain uh, patterns of magicity, as they call them. So Egil Asprum, another scholar who's been doing some really interesting work looking at um, particularly things like uh, cognitive science and, and magic, um, had an interesting suggestion based on these, the, this, uh, these this patterns of magicity idea, um, that these codings, these kind of uh, small statements could be incorporated into what he and, and Tavers call a building block approach to the study of magic and religion. And this looks at the way we ascribe special, that is spiritual, magical, or religious qualities to things, which we can then study at various levels from the kind of material and social down onto the kind of psychological and cognitive and uh, neuroscientific even. So inspired by these approaches, I attempted to kind of identify first a sort of pattern of magicity for not just the kind of ritual, the statements about magic and belief evident in uh, the excellent book, but also to the kind of whole sort of ritual technique. So this began by taking Otto and Storsberg's uh, characteristics and making a kind of short list. Um, and we uh, so we can kind of get the feel that ritual conjuration relates to supernatural agents and their kind of coercion. It's, of course, a non-legitimate form of dealing with the supernatural. Uh, you can't go into a church and talk to Job or Solomon or Luke, uh, but you can through magic. Um, but it's what is most kind of profound about what Gilbert and Davis end up with, because they've stripped away all the kind of... A, kind of um, magical implements and things is that it's really centered on the belief in the power of words and the role of performative speech which itself does things to you okay you know it, performing a, a, a conjuration or something no matter if it works or not it does does something quite profound to you which is what I'm going to kind of talk about really for the rest of this um so I kind of ended up with something with a, three kind of basic sort of statements from Storsberg and Otto, um, which told me something about kind of where Gilbert and Davis were coming from, but to actually relate it then to actually things that are happening in the ritual, I needed to add a few other things to my kind of plan. Um, while Storsberg and Otto covered kind of the idea of the power of words, the use of speech and belief in spirits, um, I also needed to add something about divine power. I mean, this could be related to concepts of mimesis or interventionism that is on their list, um, but I decided it kind of needed its own definition, uh, which I've called um, theurgic authority. Um, and furthermore, the actual results of the magical ritual yielded magical visions, yielded a sense of the presence of spirits, and um, as comes through, in the, the texts and the records of Gilbert kind of raging at the spirits, there was this affect induction, this emotional induction, uh, which was kind of, I believe, really actually kind of vital to, to their kind of dynamic. So we could take our concepts and arrange them into a kind of schema of uh, representations, actions and events. A representation denotes this kind of mental representation of a concept or a social construct. Actions describe elements of physical enactment as part of a ritual. Um, and events are the consequences, what happens, the kind of emergent experiences. So 
just to kind of work through this, I talked about this idea of theurgic authority, which is very important uh, to them. Um, to me, it, it, it kind of elaborates on the basic representational premise that God is powerful and that God can intervene in things. The impl implication here being that appealing to or partaking in divine power allows the mages to kind of borrow God's power, to conjure, constrain, and compel the naughty spiritual and demonic entities. Of course, the authority to do this is invoked through the power of words, appeals to God, and the invocation of holy names uh, in particular. Which kind of brings us on to the kind of center of everything, the whole kind of area of magical speech. It's the chief mode of ritual action. He doesn't, you know, tell you to make a circle or, you know, do anything particularly else except have your books, have your scryer, have your mirror and uh, start calling. Um, so there seems to be kind of, um, you've got the prayers, conjurations and constraints here that are addressed to both God and the spirits and they physically through speech and kind of move, bodily movement while you're speaking, uh, they articulate these ideas about divine power, spirits, and the power of words. The speech is performative and it's illocu illocutionary. It's uttered to make, uh, to kind of convey and induce feelings or effects. And it's also used to kind of make things happen. So the types of um, effective speech we find in the excellent book uh, are related to the kind of four particular forms of utterance that uh, Gilbert gives us. We have prayers, conjurations, sentences, and bonds. The bond uh, marks the culmination of a ritual. It's associated with urging a spirit to remain in the stone until it's dismissed. But the other forms of ritual speech suggest that they, they're kind of inducing particular kind of feelings, particular affective states, adjunct to their role within the ritual dynamic. Um, so we could kind of examine these speeches from a standpoint of balance, kind of positive and negative effect. Um, the voices, the tone of these different modes of speech suggest uh, what I've called um, abnegative, authoritative and maledictive voices. So when they're kind of beginning out, uh, beginning the ritual, there's often a prayer, which is a kind of abnegative voice, because it emphasizes the relationship of the magus and the divine power through this kind of performance of ritual humility. It's very kind of pious language. Um, Gilbert urges you to say these words with a good heart. So he's telling you to kind of feel something in the way that you're, you're speaking these words. Um, so it's kind of typical pronouncement might be something like, I, most wretched sinner, do desire thee to be my help, that this spirit may now come and fulfill my will. O oh Lord, be my help and assistance, that I may by thy power call him, and not by my own power. The ritual kind of then moves on to these conjurations, these kind of authoritative, coercive voices, which are addressed to the spirit itself with occasional appeals to divine power to kind of compel it or strengthen the magician's case. So a typical kind of form of this voice would be something like, O oh, thou spirit, which art a living and loving spirit to the commandments of God, I charge thee in the name of Jesus Christ that thou do appear here visibly to my scryer without any delay. I conjure and command thee, and by God's power constrain thee that thou do appear here and do my commandments without any more stay. However, if the spirit does not appear, which seems to happen uh, with surprising regularity uh, in the records, um, a sentence or a curse is delivered. So this is not just a coercive voice, but kind of actively maledictive, brimming with kind of fury and sarcasm directed towards the obstinate spirit. So, Evidently, such a kind of mode of declamation accords with Gilbert's choleric character and his kind of military and you know, quite cruel background. So uh, an example of this form of speech is something like, oh, thou spirit, 
who has been taken for a noble spirit and king, yet I cannot find it in thee. By thy disobeying of God's word, I by God's power curse thee and excommunicate thee and deprive thee and condemn thee for thy disobedience. And I think this passage between this kind of abnegative, authoritative and maledictive uh, series of pronouncements really kind of inf informs the flow of the ritual itself. And moving between them precipitates effective events, altering the mood and physiology of both the master and his scryer. So this kind of dynamic between the master kind of prostrating himself and then commanding the spirits and then venting his anger at them while the scryer sits and waits for a manifestation uh, could suggest a kind of complex interaction between psychological states uh, triggered by what Gellhorn described as the tuning of the nervous system where either the kind of arousal system, which he called ergotropic, or the relaxation systems, the trophotopic, are kind of overstimulated, triggering the other complementary system and yielding a kind of hybrid psychological state characterized by some features of sleeping and some features of waking, this kind of ritual trance, so to speak. The suggestion here being that ritual flow towards a kind of pronounced state of violent arousal that the conjurations work towards was actually kind of necessary to create that environment in which the spirits could be discerned. Uh, Frank Clarson has also suggested that the prayers and ritual and conjurations of ritual magic function as loose, what he calls visionary scripts, almost like more intense versions of what we might call a path working in contemporary magic, which is a position that makes much more sense when we consider ritual magic and the conjuration of spirits is historically a master and scryer relationship rather than kind of the pursuit of a solitary magician in a suburban basement uh, as uh, often uh, is the case today. Um, just to briefly touch on the kind of remaining elements of this kind of schema, obviously the speech thing and the effect is the main thing. Um, we also have these apprehensions of spirits within the stone which is the intended outcome of all these prayers and conjurations and, and so on that compose the ritual. Exactly what the stone is, isn't kind of fully explained in the text, but it's hinted at often. It's said to be flat on both sides of a good thickness and may even have been set into the wall or sometimes placed on a pedestal or sometimes placed on a book or a cloth. Um, but the production of visions uh, and attended states of altered consciousness is obviously a, a vastly complex uh, field. Um, we don't kind of know exactly what happened in their ritual chamber, but set into a wall, for example, or in a dim, dimly candlelit chamber, um, you can imagine the scryer sitting before it and it taking on subtly reflective qualities. And the, of course, the psychological experiments with participants gazing at their own reflections in low illumination environments, often yield a swift onset of facial distortions um, and a kind of um, very kind of interesting state of, 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 of uh, kind of liminal sort of consciousness after a while. It's one technique that's been exploited by at least one contemporary Western magician uh, working the grimoire tradition. But we could also consider the role of what anthropologists like Richard Knoll has called image cultivation or Tanya Lerman as inner sense cultivation, which talks about the sort of gradual development of intuitive inner senses of imagery. But these are ones that kind of in a magical context frequently phenomenologically blur the boundaries of the real and imagined. That this is also kind of something that's going on here is suggested by the gradual manner in which, according to the Diary of Visions, these kind of visions begin being had by John Davis, but then gradually they kind of come to Humphrey Gilbert and gradually they escape from the glass into the kind of environment around them. Finally, to sort of touch on the, um, the actual kind of apprehension of spirits, this, there's this kind of sense of presence um, as an event resulting from the ritual action. It's evident in the text that the spirits could on occasion be somehow sensed 
yet not entirely visible to the scryer. We've got this trust no spirit visible or invisible that Al mentioned. So Gilbert provides several methods by which a spirit invisible in a stone might be compelled to appear. The manifestations of a spirit being indicated by a sense of uncanny presence or alien intelligence has been, of course, recounted by various contemporary magicians. While James Allen Chain talked about this sensed presence, which I'm sure we've all experienced in a kind of, you know, dark and familiar place as being related to our evolutionary inheritance of threat detection mechanisms. This idea that being aware of potential predators in a dark cave, for example, helped us survive longer. And that these can often trigger kind of subsequent hallucinations based on our own interpretive efforts to find, identify and elaborate, the so elaborate on the source of threats. And of course, I, I guess kind of demon that you're potentially summoning is more threatening than uh, you know, a more uh, benevolent spirit as well. So perhaps this is the sense in which those things shadowy are then uh, interpreted and brought out into spiritual encounters and visions within the glass. Um, I should say, as I draw to a conclusion of our talks, that obviously it's not, it's not exactly my intention to psychologize away magic. If anything, I think this is really interesting for both practitioners and scholars and anyone kind of in between because it points to the potential and reality of the kind of incredible and uncanny experiences that magic can potentially open to people. So just to conclude, um, I'm sorry I'm running a little late. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the work of Gilbert and Davis kind of a received comparatively little interest until recently. Um, and we've only kind of scratched the surface over the last uh, 40, 50 minutes. As you can hopefully appreciate, the documents are kind of compelling and potentially vital for the sort of insight they give us into historical practices of both composing a ritual magic text and the performance of it and the record of visionary experiences surrounding it. Um, so it's evident that the master and scryer work together to co-produce the text and the visionary experiences. Um, and reading entries in the visions, such as the encounter with the branded dog that uh, seem to actually occur outside the glass, we can see these implications for magical states of consciousness and image cultivation being carried beyond the confines of the ritual chamber, which is kind of really interesting. And all this is taking place against a wider background of magically modified behaviors. They'd isolated themselves for weeks. They'd reordered time by getting up at sunrise and revisiting the chamber at sunset. Um, they'd no doubt lived quite ascetically, I presume. They're immersed in their, their good books while praying with ardent intent. All of these kind of psychological factors that Frank Clarsen considers vital for a successful experience of magic. It would seem likely that such visions and enchantments were probably all too subjective, though, for the demanding and pragmatic Gilbert and Davis to persist in their experiments. The procedures detailed in the excellent book show that they expected spirits to be able to perform such feats as collecting a ring from water and laying it in the hands of the master. Uh, in actual practice, this results in Gilbert cursing the spirits for their obstinacy, after which another spirit would invariably appear with a promise of a, a great book or another spirit to be conferred with. Um, sometimes I don't know whether John Davis just felt completely bullied into kind of trying to produce this phenomena by uh, Gilbert's um, totally fearsome countenance. Um, but it's evident that this was all compelling and the visions were lucid. Um, Although returning to this topic of proof that I started with, um, it also seems probable that the unwillingness of these spirits to prove themselves assertively on the physical plane led to the abandonment of the work. Nonetheless, the excellent book of visions uh, and visions presents us with a kind of insight into this life cycle of a magical text. And although we know a great deal about the characters involved an attempt to work out what's kind of happening in the black boxes of their minds, means that it still contains enough enigmas to kind of keep us all busy uh, and to can continue to make it a compelling objective of study for both practitioners, scholars, and those kind of floating in between. So thank you.
20th of February, 1567. Very good, very good. Yep. So that was very early in their, yeah. their, their kind yeah. of procedures, really. In some ways, I'm a kind of bit of a simulation kind of skeptic, um, but I do think that all these kind of things do um, really kind of underline the subjectivity of uh, our perceptions about reality, um, as do you know abnormal states of does uh, abnormal psychology and and so on. Um, so I, yeah, I'm sure there's a connection in there, but um, personally, it's uh, one that I think someone else is better <laughs> suited to make than myself. I mean, the most obvious like thing that springs to mind for me is is looking at a variety of the philosophies and cosmovisions that get called Gnostic, either with a big or a, uh, a small g. Uh, there are an awful lot of them, uh, and many of these, you know, whether or not with. We're taking a very broad approach to like, you know, uh, uh, you know, brain in a jar slash Descartes daimon, right? Uh, of how do you know you, you know, you're actually seeing what you're seeing. There's, there's, you know, that kind of skepticism level stuff. Uh, but then there's, there's an awful lot of, you know, uh, very religious, very, very magically um, weaponized uh, religious and theological ideas around, um, you know, wh whether this is the, the actual thing we're dealing with or the you know the black iron prison that never fell uh from uh, you know uncle phil really that we've got um particularly kind of in ritual magic where we have this kind of idea that the sort of gold standard is to actually have a spirit standing in front of you as a kind of physical manifestation um you know i think that's in some ways kind of very much bound up with our kind of need for proof that I, I've kind of talked about. Whereas um, I kind of suspect that historically, although the visions of the excellent book are kind of extremely kind of lucid, um, that things often happened on a bit more of a subtle and imaginatively uh, kind of mediated level. Um, so uh, I think that it's a kind of, something of a kind of uh, particularly kind of from the standpoint of contemporary pr practitioners something that's a little bit uh, you know maybe thought of as kind of a bit fluffy or whatever uh, because it's not real hardcore there is a demon standing in my kind of basement kind of magic um, but it's it's in there um, you know Agrippa talks about how that it the magic of uh, the voices of the spirits and so on kind of slide into us their communication slides into us like a lot you know an, an image falling on a glass um which i think is all about kind of imagination and intuition uh you know you're creating this ritual space and then kind of listening into the spirits and uh a lot of kind of the later kind of um occultists and things were you know quite into the imagination of course i'm not just talking about kind of you know the occult revival but um people like robert flood you know who was all about kind of you have to kind of reach this mental state where kind of part of your mind opens up to receive this kind of influx of of, of kind of higher knowledge um yeah, which was yeah. So an, what he did in geomancy as well yeah there's a there's a concept of like the affectivity of the field like nature of imagination you can catch other people's nightmares right uh, so, it, yeah, like you say, like it's easy. I think it's very easy for contemporary, modern practitioners to to look at the power of the imagination and think it's psychologizing something that is actually like already deeply infested with spirits. <laughs> Would say that we could talk about the functionality of spirits and what they're doing and you know where they are served in in, in terms of things uh, but i'd also say you know i'm not uh, a hungan or an initiate of uh, you know any any houses of haitian vodou uh, or, or other forms um so could we i mean sure uh, should we uh, <laughs> maybe not um i, I think the, the comparison between a, a fallen angel and a, and a loire uh is um is one that we need to know a lot more about both of those things to be able to 
to have useful things to say. And a lot of that stuff is going to be initiated priest knowledge um, to, for, for want of a better term. In terms of, so yeah, I think, I think that's, that's, that's worth bearing in mind that like, sure, this, this idea of gatekeeper, but does, um, what are we, what are we doing? Are we, are we appealing to Azazel to just open the gates or is the, the Lord of the dead who is doing a bunch of things? I, um, I, I appreciate the, the effort to look cross-culturally at what different, how pe different people are, you know, doing magic and, and, and spirit work and things, but I, I, I don't know if that's as useful to compare as it is to contrast, shall we say. And also, you know, acknowledging that, uh, speaking on things that we aren't like, <laughs> that, that, that we aren't necessarily qualified to speak on is not helpful for anyone. It's, it's interesting because there's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of formal conjurations that say, you know, um, by, you know, by the power of Christ, I command you Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa's ghost to turn up in this triangle of manifestation. It's a lot more that they are doing. It seems that they're doing at least the, the prayer delivered by Solomon and a bunch of other prayers asking for his, uh, uh, some of your good hidden works, uh, asking for this, these knowledge and eventually these, these literal books uh, and the understanding of these transmissions of texts. And bear in mind, book here, you know, in the, in the wider corpus can mean anything from like, you know, a stone with a spirit in it that tells you some things. So uh, to what extent are we, are we ex again, are we expecting, or, or was Gilbert expecting these, these uh, spirits to turn up with a physical book of magic and how much is, you know, uh, Kelly style being read in, in a book that's being shown to them like out of the stone and then copied out? And to what extent is it, you know, is it something more affective and, and imaginal and like, imbued. So that's, that's the start. Mostly they turn up and they give them very specific instructions about what to wear, uh, how to act, um, an awful lot of like general be good to the poor, uh, clean apparel as Phil mentioned, uh, a lot of black, um, you know, uh, necromancers, uh, you know, it's not just sartorially elegant, it's also sorcerously, you know, useful uh, to, to wear a lot of black apparently. Uh, the knowledge they're looking for is, is, is knowledge to uh, summon spirits to be able for those spirits to be able to bring them more books to be able to summon better spirits uh, and be able to do better magic they are they're, they're kind of bootstrapping themselves that style i i, I sometimes refer to them as there's, there's a certain degree of like self-fulfilling uh, uh prophethood here that they're, they're trying to um see the early visions are them uh, are them seeing themselves doing the magic in in in, in the stone that they will later do in the and the oratory and, and apparently works as well. So they're also scrying on themselves to see what it looks like to do proper magic. Uh, so that this kind of like gets a little wibbly wobbly timey wimey for me. Uh, and this notion of, yeah, they are, they are scrying on their future selves uh, potentially. I, I, I think that's an interesting angle. I don't know how specifically they would have envisaged it as that. Um, as for inspiration for the practice, I think it, you know, um, it makes, I mean, partly they, they, they say, you know, it's, there's a, there's a love of uh, dead, of, of some dead men for uh, living people, uh, that there is a sympathia there, that we have something more in common. And I don't think that's just, um, uh, I don't think that's just like sentimental. I think that's, that's very much a, a sense of like Flood talking about the, the harmony of, 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 of the blood of mankind, that like a, a, every human has access to this sense of like uh, a sympathia with with others potentially and that that doesn't necessarily that that might change in death but it doesn't necessarily go away uh there's there's also like you know later folk catholic ideas that um the souls of great men uh may be charged to stick around uh, in the places that they um that they hung out at and to help uh, the next generation of people do whatever it is they're doing uh, and so i i, I see i see uh, a context a cultural context of, of that as well in this that uh if we're doing magic um why not speak to dead magicians about it um you know who, who better to ask i think um also that obviously there's this big kind of relationship with the grimoires there um but uh, that's kind of tradition but i think one of their real innovations is this kind of necromantic angle which isn't you know it may be kind of possibly latent in the grimoires but or the ritual magic text that they were drawing on, I should say. Um, but 
that seems to be their own kind of one of their own particular innovations because it's not really part of those rituals of Azazel which are often about going to a particular grave you know a new grave and kind of binding using that that as a kind of way to contact the spirit rather than you know saying oh Azazel he's he can bring all these guys to a kind of beck and call which I you know I think is uh, one of their kind of uh, innovations perhaps arising from from John Davies' own visions but I think it's a whole kind of area that we possibly need to do more kind of research into. Yeah and, and, and just quickly as a, as a shout out to, to, to Brian Johnson's Necromancy in the Medici Library there is the, the experiment of Michael Scott Necromancer which is about summoning a tutor like a dead tutor so we have that idea seeding in around the 15th century right but yeah i agree it's, it's it's very much an innovation to be like let's call up like a gripper himself like rather than uh let's use his haunted books you know that reminds me i really need to check out brian's book <laughs> good. Uh, it's on uh, you know there's a there's a there's a talk about it i hear uh, uh from, 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 <laughs> yeah, yes i've not i've not caught up. well i've kind of half caught up uh, with I'm pretty, you know, happy to say, and especially with, uh, you know, recent work from uh, Frank Clarsen and Sharon Hubbs Wright, that certainly working with the Four Kings was not the, you know, exclusively the preserve of like, you know, toffs and like courtiers, like, you know, like, like, like Gilbert is, let's be fair, um, as well as, you know, a military man. Uh, so that Four Kings are turning up in a variety of, of cunning crafts of the time uh, and, 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 you know, actual service magicians, not just people. Um, summoning to, to, to see what's up. Um, I'd also, but on the other hand, the idea that it's just a pastime uh, or like a curiosity, I think it's, it's worth pointing out that there is this slightly millenarianist angle to uh, Gilbert and Davies' work as well, where they are kind of conceiving that this is the last days and that they are, at, they are told they're going to be saints, or at least Gilbert is told he will be made a saint. Uh, and so there's this sense of like, this is, while it's primarily magical and, and designed to produce, you know, knowledge and uh, spirits and more knowledge and more spirits, there's, there is also the sense that like they are, uh, there's a, there's, there's, there's a, I don't want to say soteriological because they're not like redeeming themselves, but there's a sense of like becoming more holy in it as well. But yeah, uh, uh, the, the four kings turn up there, scrying, the idea of like turning up with a stone and a call, like lots of people are using stones to see things or to bring spirits to see things. Um, the idea of uh, good books to call by, of, of not, of, of do the usual seems to be a pretty standard thing uh, in, in an awful lot of say, I'm, I'm contrasting, you know, uh, this, the, these kinds of uh, more uh, courtly magicians to, you know, the, 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 the down and dirty village wizards and wise women that we call cunning folk. But I, I see a lot of parallels in that. I don't know about what you think, Phil. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't really have <laughs> uh, anything to add. Uh, you know, it always seems to me like magic is kind of like music. It kind of flows up and down the kind of social hierarchies. Um, so yeah, I'm in agreement there. Uh, I was going to say, uh, uh, yeah, uh, folks can, can check out website and things like that, uh, but I am, uh, I'm excited to be doing the Salem Witchcraft and Folklore Festival. Uh, I'm talking about Unbewitching, and I'm also going to be uh, hosting uh, a panel of folk magicians um, that we ended up calling uh, Folk Around and Find Out because no one could suggest a better title. Um, not that that's a good title necessarily. I, 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 I am looking forward to uh, hosting that and, and speaking with a, a variety of folk practitioners from different traditions around the world. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to that. But yeah, I would say that. Um, as for myself, uh, I think concentrating on music a little more uh, for the next few months. Uh, play, coming down to London to play a gig tomorrow uh, with my group Hawthorne at Corsica Studios. Um, and in between then and releasing our new album in autumn, I'll probably be trying to work on my PhD, which is about um, autoethnography and esotericism and music. So that's where I am. Fabulous, mate. Cheers. Take care, everyone. Okay.